Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Our safety review is that the, in the south side of the building, if you walk and exit behind the project team, that's the exit here. The restrooms are out the door past the stairs to the left. And if you're at home, hopefully you know how to handle any emergency that you may have. Next slide. So uh, in person, we always have a Q&A portion after each section. We'll all make sure we get as many of the questions answered as we can. Uh, we may ask you to allow us to move a question to the next section if it's more appropriate there. We also recognize that we may not have an answer to every question asked. So we will also ask your indulgence to allow us to get the right answer and get it to you after the meeting. Uh, for those who are home, there are a couple of ways. Next slide that you can ask questions, you can type your question at any time in the chat. And when we get to the Q&A section, we will make sure that we uh, read your question or you can raise your hand and we will call on you and pipe you into the room and get the answer that you uh, to your question then. Next slide. So for today's meeting, uh, the areas that we're gonna cover, we're gonna start with introductions, do the project overview and construction updates, uh, environmental management update, uh, update around the zero emission bus um, initiative, what to expect for the remainder of 2023, and then an art and transit update. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the project lead, Maya, to do the introductions. Good evening, Maya. Good evening. Thank you, Denzel. And good afternoon, Northern community and guests here, on, here in the room and online. Um, on the agenda today, we have uh, introduction, project overview and construction updates, environmental management updates, zero emission updates, uh, what to expect for 2023, and you know, of course, arts and transit. Um, with that, my name is Maya Nino. I'm the senior capital um, program manager with the infrastructure with WMATA. Um, with me today, we have Mr. Um, Phil Sheraton. He is the project manager with Clark Construction. We also have Mr. Tom Robinson. He is uh, the PMCM project manager. Um, we also have Mr. Jim Ash. He is our um, director for civil structure engineering and our environmental coordinator uh, with WMATA. We have online uh, Miss Andy Laney. She is the project coordinator for arts and transit with WMATA. And last but not least, we have Miss Amy Mazdrobian. She's the director for zero emission uh, vehicles uh, with WMATA. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Phil Sheraton. Thank you very much, Maya. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, those who are in the neighborhood have seen that we have been quite busy uh, since we last met in January. A uh, couple of the key updates uh, at a high level is with DOB, we received the first full round of review on our final building permit. And we're in the process of closing out those comments and expect that permit to be issued in the coming quarter. With DC Water, we did complete the large plan review process and approval. And under our construction contract, which started last October 3rd, uh, we've been quite busy at the site and we have completed the transition from the uh, administrative offices that we had within Northern Bus into our construction period field offices that are located along Arkansas Avenue. Next slide, please. Diving into a few more of the details and pictures of what's been going on behind the fence. As any large construction project in the district that includes an existing facility requires, there is environmental remediation that must proceed the major demolition activities. As part of those environmental remediation tasks, we have completed the removal of the underground storage and above ground storage tanks that were in the facility. We have removed all of the old bus maintenance and service equipment and we com completed the regulated waste capture and removal. This would be things such as mercury and thermostats, uh, PCB ballast and lighting and things of that nature. And uh, the, the slide says started, but we actually completed our uh, certified industrial hygienist checks on the asbestos abatement uh, at the end of April. Next slide, please. Uh, as that mobilization, uh, we've completed the secure uh, construction fencing, the longer term fencing, Jersey barriers, maintenance of traffic under the DDOT approved plans around the perimeter of the site. 
As I noted earlier, the field trailer office complexes, there's uh, eight trailer facilities today. There is still one to come that we needed to remove a portion of the building before it can be erected. And that'll be happening in the next month or so. And then we've uh, had installed and continue to uh, do noise vibration and air quality monitoring on the property and reporting that information to WMATA on a monthly basis. Next slide, please. So with the facade bracing, uh, this is probably the most visible outward facing component of our work uh, that is uh, in place. It's along 14th Street where we're protecting the historic facade that was um, that has been designated to be preserved. Um, that picture is on the left here. And then uh, another very important feature was the uh, underpinning and resupport of the historic tower. And you can see the new column and foundations that are on the, the east face of the tower that have been now installed and that load has been uh, jacked and transferred. The next slide, please. As the abatement activities that I noted a few moments ago uh, were completed, that allowed us to move forward into the start of the mass demolition of our building. We started that along the Decatur cover structure, um, and then we have continued to move forward into the main building as our utility disconnects were completed by um, Pepco, DC Water, and Verizon. The next major portion of the facility that we've tackled was the demolition of all the former parking structure that was on the southern third, as well as the eastern half of the site. Uh, we have continued the what's called hand separation or the detailed deconstruction of the back roof and walls that tie into that facade that's being preserved. And right now we're very happy to report to date that we're actually um, repurposing 98% of our construction demolition waste. Uh, it's all the brick and concrete and reinforcing steel. Uh, all of that is going out to recycle and reuse. The next slide, please. Another major activity that happened right at the end of quarter one uh, was the beginning of what is called supportive excavation and then the soils excavation. The supportive excavation are those systems that will allow us to safely excavate uh, to the planned bottom of the uh, new basements. And that work started behind the administration building and will be ongoing for the next several months. Another critical early task was getting approval on the rock removal plans. Um, most of our rock is in the northwest portion of the site, uh, close to the historic administration building and historic facade. That required us to come up with a very detailed rock excavation plan that will minimize any potential excavation uh, induced vibrations on those historic features that are being preserved. And that was recently approved. We have started the beginning of minor excavation activities that are largely to support supportive excavation. And in the coming month, we will start to see the mass excavation on the northwest component of the site. The next slide, please. So as we look through the rest of quarter two, 2023, uh, we will near the completion of our demolition activities in early July. We will continue to offer pre-construction surveys at any time to those neighbors that are eligible. We are finishing the installation of the additional instrumentation required ahead of that excavation to monitor the ground conditions. And then uh, the facade bracing support steel, there's a few elements that are tied to that hand separation that go hand in hand as we wrap that up. And as I noted earlier, the supportive excavation will continue into the summer. That mass excavation will get underway. And in the late part of the second quarter, we will start the new deep foundation test program. Our next slide, please. The agency collaboration has been ongoing as I've reported at each of these quarterly meetings. I've touched on the building permit. With Washington Gas, with great support from WMATA, we have finalized our new meter design inside of the building, and we're working on the finalization of the new service extension from the uh, 13th Street area along Buchanan Street. 
With DDOT, we're in a stage of just periodic inspection at this point for our maintenance of traffic that is uh, allowing our pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists to safely navigate around our active construction site. With DC water, the other approvals that were received is our final water and sewer plans are approved and uh, recent activity is the, the longer term connections for temporary water and sewer for our trailer. And with PEPCO, um, we have most of our service, but PEPCO has a shortage of transformers and it's why we have not been able to convert our temporary generator over to PEPCO power at this time. We work with them weekly chasing that uh, material that's on shortfall in their inventory. We are working on finalizing our building service design approvals, and we have kicked off a regular cadence of meetings associated with our BEB. And Amy will be speaking more about those great uh, updates on BEB shortly. And with DOEE, I know we have a couple of representatives in the room today. Jim will be speaking expensively on our environmental uh, work in the upcoming uh, session, next section, and the stormwater management plans for our site have been approved. That brings us to, I don't see, a, uh, from a battery electric bus design update, uh, will be the next slide, please. Um, this is a very high level view of the uh, basement level bus storage. There's 131 vehicles down here. And um, the heavy black lines, what you're seeing is the power distribution network that will integrate with the pantograph style chargers that will uh, allow the energy to re recharge the batteries on the buses. The next slide upstairs is uh, the current layout and from a battery electric standpoint on the maintenance level we're only going to be using portable chargers which are plug-in uh, so there'll be uh, no meaningful update to the maintenance level. The next slide is on our roof as part of WMATA's initiative to reduce their carbon emissions throughout their facility we are not only uh, de-dieseling, if you will, the bus fleet, but also the non-revenue support vehicles and the area with the little clouds there on the drawing are 42 new, uh, they were dedicated uh, non-revenue parking spots as part of our uh, parking plan to make sure everyone that works in the building is um, not in the neighborhood, but 42 more of those are now going to be electrified for all of WMATA's non-revenue vehicles to support the bus operations. Next slide. These are some, uh, I'm not gonna get into the details, but there's a couple pictures. At the maintenance, le a lower parking level, uh, there'll be three major uh, battery electric charging uh, switch uh, gear facilities. You can see them in this plan. The next slide uh, please shows at the maintenance level, there'll also be one more cubicle of battery electric, so four total. And uh, that is, uh, where we're at with the battery electric. There's both PEPCO gear and battery gear on both levels. And then our next slide is just a, you know, to check in on the pre-construction surveys. I know we've continued to show the slide. We wanna to continue to encourage our community members again that are eligible to use the phone number, use the email. Uh, all else fails, reach the WMATA uh, contact line and we will be happy to get those scheduled. And the last slide I think I have before a Q&A break is again the overlay. If, if your home or building or a commercial building is within the shaded area on this plan, that's the 200 foot uh, zone of uh, eligible properties. So. All of this information is in the past and is on the website. We um, again strongly encourage folks to participate in that program and it's time for questions. Thank you, Phil. So I uh, just wanna acknowledge, I know we had a comment, I think um, there is some ambient noise in the room. It's the whirl of the air conditioning unit. So if you, you know, we do apologize, but that is something that we cannot control. Um, so with that, I'm going to check in the room and see if there are any questions regarding the construction update section.
Jim, you want to answer that one? Or can, okay, yes. Um, so right now we are, uh, we've been working with DOE and uh, WMATA on creating a format that um, will be shared with the community. So we're fine tuning exactly how there's a lot of raw data and we're trying to digest it to a level of data that is informative, but also not overwhelming for the community to try and search. So um, I was actually ahead of the meeting showing Jim some of the vibration and dust and we're working on the noise, which is a more complex data set to present, but we will be sharing those in, in the near future as we work through the format. Sure, yes. yes, and that will be shared on the project website as well, correct? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions for this section? One second. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, in your statement that you report out to the neighbors who uh, qualify or the neighbors that you will be required to report out. Who are those neighbors that you are required to report out to? The, uh, I'll clarify if uh, perhaps the, uh, I misstated something for you. There are properties within two, any property that is within 200 feet of our project perimeter is eligible to the pre-construction survey program where those properties, if they opt in, we will send out an independent engineer. They will do a survey of the property. The property owner receives a copy of that survey for your records. We do what we call at this point a pre-construction survey. At the end of the project, as we approach the end, we will offer post-construction surveys and it gives those property owners, you know, how, do, how was the condition of the property at the start and at the end? And if there is a difference, it helps that person with a potential claims process if there is one relative to any repairs that might be necessary. So the other part was the vibration noise. That, that, that information, once it's posted, will be posted on the project website. So it's available to everybody. It, it's not restricted once it's posted. Did that answer your question? All right, thank you. Ms. Dukta. Um, yes, I had, I had a couple of questions. Um, I did see the, the floor plans for the electric, but what I didn't see was any floor plans for the commercial space, the, in, the uh, Metropolitan Transit Police Department headquarters, uh, the community room, uh, other aspects of the project other than where the electrical outlets are going to be on each floor. The other concern I have is relative to, um, and this wasn't in the slide, but I think it does have to do directly with construction, which is the parking. Um, there are, I don't know who they are because they are vehicles are not identifiable with any commercial markings. Um, but I know that there were at least today, just today, I've got pictures from other days where workers at the site have been parking on 14th Street. So I know one of our subcontractors that started this week had three vehicles and we had them move this morning when we saw them, the strip matter um, was, I know at least one of the trucks was, uh, was labeled and then geo instruments needed to initially stage a truck, which was moved once we had a piece of equipment moved inside that was staged at our driveway cut, not in one of the parking spots this morning, but I will. Uh, let, let me take a break at the break. I will, okay. I will come look at those with you. Okay. Right. Plus it, 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 we it have is, more than a couple people. So I want to make sure everybody. But. Yeah. I, I will work to that. Going to your other comment, Mr. Up to the, that information is on the plans. It's not highlighted. We can certainly look at a different way to present those graphics and I can color code retail, the community room we have in the past, but it's all those spaces are on that maintenance level plan that I showed. So I think you want to make sure. So there were two parts. There was the non-operational spaces of the unit, 
which he doesn't have, but we'll have to make sure we put that on there. But you also talked about unmarked. So there are cars and trucks, or just cars that you were speaking. I just want to make sure that we're clear on what you're saying. It's generally, it's, it's Ace Cole, yes, sir. Right. Um, one reason I know that is because he gets that's a jacket or whatever he had on. You know, had that had, had <laughs> that on. Um, there, there is a larger issue relative uh, to the parking, but it is it's more relative to the construction site, um, and I don't think anybody here will be able to address it, but. Um, I need to have some contact with someone in bus services because the garage is closed. The 14th Street um, turnaround at 14th in Colorado, we've been inundated by metro drivers that are parking on the public street, blocking the street, cleaning, you know, vehicles, things of that nature. And so if this is going to be going on until 2027, um, that area around 14th and Colorado needs some relief. So we'll make sure you have that conversation, allow that to happen. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if Ian is doing it. Hands has been helping me out with it, but... Um, so wait, we're gonna have it. We're gonna, no, I'm sorry. You, I wanna make sure we get that compliment on the microphone. <laughs> no, Ann, Ann is, oh, Ann is a gem. There you go. All right. That's all I need. Thank you. All right. Next question. Thank you. Garage is going to be a primary electric, you know, vehicle thing. Do we discuss with Pepco how they're going to generate that electricity? I was the idea you don't want to just sort of say, well, instead of burning fossil fuels here on 14th Street, we're going to boom fossil fuel solvent on Maryland and generate the electricity and transport it down here. Do we have that type of discussion with Pepco as to the source of the energy we're going to need to operate the garage? So she's coordinating with her team at a larger network. So, um, so for our electric buses, we intend that they will run on grid power. Um, so uh, Pepco provides the power for this garage and there's coordination between um, the, the project team and Pepco to make sure that we have the incoming electrical service that we'll need um, to, to fully power the garage to provide all of the, the electrical needs for the facility. So it, it, it will be grid power um, providing the, the power to charge the buses. So it sounds like Amy was, you haven't had the conversation yet where the grid piece happens for Pepco itself. So I think his question was, if they're using a, lack of a better word, coal plant to generate grid power, are you having a conversation about the plant generation? Is that accurate, sir? I mean, other as an example, like just this week, Pepco has come around to, to the neighborhood and asked, do you want to sign up for more renewable energy rather than using primarily fossil fuel energy? Do you want to, or so do they do the same thing to WMATA? Do they come around and say, look at, you have a choice of where you're going to get your energy from. We can bur we're burning fossil fuels and creating some. We're also doing some renewable energy. What do you want? Right. So that's a probably an outside the project question that we'll have to probably look into get a better answer. I know we have a question here. Yes, this is for the construction team. Um, I'd like to know: Do you have a plan to use local hires to work on this project? Um, it's. Uh, a big issue with a lot of projects going on in the city and don't they don't hire local residents and we see a flunk of of Merlin and Virginia tags coming inside the city working uh, every day and um, at workforce development we have a lot of opportunity to help uh, district residents work on these projects especially these new projects or renewable energy and it's an opportunity for uh, young men and women to learn a new part of the, the construction industry. Uh, the answer is yes, we as Clark strongly encourage that. We have an employment processing center that takes applications in the district for all of our work uh, throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. Actually, it is based in the district. 
we also strongly encourage our subcontracting team members to uh, also do a fair share of hiring so that the work site looks like the community we're working in. We can't force them to, but we can encourage them to. But I can say for certain as Clark, for the workforce that we direct hire, we will and have continued to be a strong advocate of hiring district and district residents, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, with that, we'll turn it over to Jim for the next update. Thank you. Good evening. Slide, please. Slide, please. As, as we go through these slides, I'm going to start with this. Many of the slides that we have that I'm presenting this evening were presented at the previous meeting. And I'm doing that because we have new data and I want to integrate the two data sets and you'll be able to see graphically what's going on. Um, as in looking at environmental remediation in the soil and groundwater, we're looking at three principal sources, if you will. The first is the, are the underground storage tanks. Uh, the second then are the chlorinated solvents, and those are located along Buchanan Avenue. And the third category are other uh, contaminants that are present, not in a, in a particular spatial pattern in the way that the first two are. Slide, please. We've identified a number of potential sources of contamination of note are the, is the underground storage tank farm that was located near the intersection of Arkansas Avenue and Iowa Avenue. And you see two orange uh, oblong or oval shapes uh, there as, long as, as well as a purple uh, tank. That's where the tank farm was located. And that's where, as you'll see later, we're seeing the bulk of our uh, petroleum contamination. The second uh, area then that's not shown in this graphic because it's a historic use are the chlorinated solvents. There were several facilities, a garage and perhaps a dry cleaner that were located uh, facing Buchanan uh, Street before WMATA purchased the property. Um, the, and as we've gotten in and done soil sampling and groundwater sampling, we've seen a pattern of chlorinated solvents in that area and that's where the, those contaminants uh, seem to be focused. Slide, please. These are our soil sample locations uh, where we've collected soil samples. Uh, as we've looked at the, slide, please, as we've looked at the data, um, what we've seen is uh, petroleum soil and petroleum groundwater contamination. That's from figure, figure six and seven of the original, the comprehensive site assessment. Uh, and that's consistent with the results of past investigations. The chlorinated solvents, as I said, is located along uh, Buchanan Street. We did identify an elevated lead detection in the soil sample across Arkansas Avenue, and that was believed to be an artifact of lead service pipes that previously existed in the District of Columbia. We have detected light non-aqueous phase liquid, in other words, free product, free petroleum product, in the area of the uh, underground storage tanks. And, but we have looked for, but we've not seen any dense non-aqueous phase liquid, the chlorinated solvents existing in a free phase. The, the, the solvents can either be by themselves in the groundwater column, or they can be dissolved in the groundwater plume. If they're by themselves, it, that tends to mean there's a lot more waste in the environment. We're not seeing that so far. And we've looked, we've done several tests to do that. Slide, please. So this slide shows the results from the spring 2022 comprehensive site assessment. Uh, these are the soil results. And you'll notice all we're seeing in soil are the petroleum detections. We're not seeing any chlorinated solvents in the soil test. And this is the spring of 2022. Slide, please. This is the most recent data set, and this is information that's being presented for the first time. Uh, similarly, we're seeing a lot of petroleum detections in soil, but we're not seeing chlorinated solvent detections in soil. Slide, please. This is previously presented data. These are the groundwater results. And as you see, the petroleum contamination seems to be concentrated 
around the underground storage tanks located near the intersection of Iowa and Arkansas, while the chlorinated solvent detections are located along Buchanan Street. Slide, please. This slide is new information. And we, we continue to have a pattern that we've seen before with a concentration of petroleum contamination around the underground storage tanks with the chlorinated solvents being located along Buchanan Street. In this slide, though, we have one detection where we have both petroleum and chlorinated solvents detected in the same water sample. Slide, please. As a refresher, groundwater flow, uh, this is the groundwater surface, is towards the southeast, towards Arkansas Avenue. Um, this if free product, free petroleum product, will tend to float on top of the groundwater aquifer and roll, if you will, downhill on top of the groundwater surface. So it's going to tend to move towards Arkansas Avenue. We've gotten one detection of petroleum across Arkansas Avenue. We've put samples or sampling points around that to try and understand what's going on. We've not detected patrol, any other petroleum in that area. Slide, please. This map then shows the, surf, the bedrock surface. Uh, petroleum will float on top of the groundwater aquifer and, and flow downhill based on the groundwater. Chlorinated solvents will instead will go to the bottom of the column and roll along the top of the bedrock surface. Uh, both surfaces go towards Arkansas Avenue, but this one has a slightly different pattern. You'll notice a depression near the intersection of uh, Buchanan and Arkansas. Um, we put a sampling point in that area because that would be an area where we'd expect to see some pooling of chlorinated solvents if it was in a free product situation. We did not find any, we did not get any detections there and that was good news. The, we've been asked to provide uh, underground storage, uh, a map of the underground storage structures that are going to be placed on site. This is a graphic, but this graphic has some, uh, uh, something that's been overcome by events. As many of you know, the, uh, as, as we've discussed, uh, we're gonna be put, powering buses at this facility by uh, electricity. We'll have no need for the large underground storage tank that's shown on Buchanan Street. So that will, be, uh, that will not be constructed. We may add a small underground storage tank for the generator, the emergency generator that we need to have on site for, to continue operations in the event of loss of power. But the large underground storage tank will be removed from the project. This slide then shows our remediation plan elements. Um, we are in, we continue in discussions with DOEE, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But our, uh, we can, we removed all of the underground storage tank structures and the storage vessels. We will remove petroleum impacted soil and we'll dispose of it appropriately. Um, if we encounter, we will, for the areas where we know we've got issues, that, that's pretty straightforward. As we're opening up the ground, if we identify other areas with petroleum contamination, those areas will be removed as well. The standards for remediation there are the so-called tier one levels. We will remove free phase petroleum product that's present in the site. During our second round of water, uh, water sampling, we did identify additional free product at the site within the same footprint. Uh, and the total depth was about seven tenths of a foot. So about a foot of petroleum. We're trying, uh, we will get that removed from the, uh, as part of our remediation process. If we find dense non-aqueous phase liquids at the site, those will be removed as well. Uh, we have we plan to put in a vapor management system underneath the foundation, a network of pipes, if you will, along with a vapor barrier, so that after the bus garage is built, if we go in and sample the soil vapors beneath the foundation and find that there are either petroleum vapors or chlorinated solvent vapors present above regulatory thresholds, we will then bring in an air pump and a filter 
uh, carbon filters so that we can remove those contaminated vapors and run them through a treatment process before they are released to the environment. We've been told by DOE, if we have to go to that point, that there will be a, uh, air permits that will be required. They will be reviewing and monitoring our activities, and we're aware of that. But the point of putting in this uh, air collection system before while we're doing construction is that if we find that we have vapors post-construction, we don't have to go in and tear up the foundation. So we'll have the network in place before the concrete goes down, and then we'll have connection points stubbing up through the concrete floor that we'd be able to connect into. DOE has asked us to install some Sentinel wells. We are working with DOE to establish the locations of those, but they will likely be along the Arkansas Avenue perimeter since those the areas are down gradient of the site. Since our last community meeting, DOE, the UST group, which is overseeing the UST remediation, has asked for another round of sampling and we provided that information. Uh, there were no surprises. The one thing we did see was free product we, in an area where we expected to find it. So that was not a surprise. Those results were delivered in April. The land remediation group then that is managing the chlorinated solvent side and the other contaminants that are present uh, has asked for and uh, met with us on April 20th. They have asked for some additional wells. We continue our discussions with them to determine the appropriate locations for those wells. They've asked that the wells be screened or if you will sampled from the lowest part of the aquifer so we can confirm our understanding of the chlorinated solvents in that area. Likely those wells will be located along Arkansas Avenue and Buchanan Street so that we have an understand, understanding of what is leading the property. We continue in our discussions to completely uh, define what the scope of those wells will be, where they will be located and where they will be screened. Uh, our discussions with DOE continue. Uh, I've got a meeting set up with the land remediation group in about a week and a half to continue the discussions. And that concludes my presentation, Donzel. Thank you. Jim, can you say what UST represents? Thank you. Underground storage tank. Okay, of DOE. So I know that there was a lot of new and dense information in this section, so it's a great time to remind folks that a copy of the slide presentation will be on the project website and we'll make sure you have the project website address at the end of the meeting. So I just wanted to make sure I noted that. Any questions regarding the environmental update? On slide 36, um, you showed the path for the chlorinated solvents. Can you explain, um, is there a path that goes across Iowa Avenue? Because you don't have testing across Iowa Avenue. Um, could you turn to slide 36, please? Thank you. Our understanding, we, we've not detected chlorinated solvents anywhere except along Buchanan Street uh, between 14th and Arkansas. That's where we've detected the chlorinated solvents. The chlorinated solvents in the environment, because they're denser than, than water, will fall to the bottom of the water column to a point where they hit a barrier. In this case, the barrier will be bedrock. At that point, they will flow along the surface of the bedrock downhill, like as a ball would roll downhill. And we don't have the chlorinated solvents in the uh, northern part of the site. We have them in the southern part of the site, that's why. And we've not detected them anywhere in the northern part. And what they will do is, in the environment, they'll roll down the bedrock surface towards Arkansas uh, Avenue. And that's why DOE has asked for some additional sentinel wells. Does that explain? Okay, what did I miss? So, is there a contour from the site that heads, is that bedrock heading down towards Iowa Avenue from the northern part of the site? 
It, it does, but we're not okay. saying the chlorine. But you didn't, did we're you test, saying... you said you didn't test there. So are you not seeing it because you didn't test there and there is a potential path? No, we, we did test there and we did not see chlorinated solvents in the environment in that area. On the site or across Iowa? We did not test across Iowa for chlorinated solvents. Uh, but we haven't seen any in the northern part of the site, and we have no reason to believe that there are any chlorinated solvents there. Thank you. Uh, what you're showing us now is based on results uh, of the spring of 2022. I, there are two. There are two data sets. There's spring of 22 and uh, fall of 2022. So, so you're not taking into any consideration anything that has happened before 2022. I believe it. Ref so we've previously had some underground storage tanks at the site where we had some releases. We investigated those, and those were closed. Uh, there continue to be contamination. The contamination that we're seeing now is reflective of the history of that site. Please. Original round of geotechnical and environmental sampling. Uh, those were in the original reports to DEOE. And then as we went through the comprehensive site assessment in 2022, spring and fall, we've further augmented that. Uh, I think we should take the action item to go back and double check. And then I know from the Versa report, a, a 2002 era, there was a full perimeter across all of the boundary streets in the Versa report. So I think there is some data we'll have to do a little bit more work um, to, but th th this data has been looked at in, uh, but I think you're correct. And I, I don't know that we did any new data since 2019 across Arkansas because the on-site data was not leading us to believe there's been anything that's migrating in that direction because it's uphill. So that, that kind of begs a couple of questions. Would there have been contamination that dissipated, disappeared? Would you be able to say of the contamination, the age of it? Like, is it pre, you know, and I guess that's kind of what you're saying. Like, how do we know what I mean, you, is there when it got there, if you know, and if there's something that could have been there that's now gone? It's really hard to estimate the age of the releases. There have been, in a couple of cases, there have been some examples when it's been done. But generally speaking, it's hard to, to estimate the, the age of the release. Uh, Most of the testing that you all have done has been within the property's lot line. We have I'm done not, some, some testing off our property. So hold on, Mr. Ogden, I think he's, I want to make sure because okay. we want everyone to hear on the mic and he said he's not finished yet. So I want this, you to finish. This, no, I, I, I want I, Well, you got to let go on the mic. I just no, I, 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 so people don't know. <laughs> go ahead and let you, I'm going to let you ask your question. Okay. You All right, I, I'll finish. Uh, the, in continuation, you're talking about your, you're taking responsibility in 2019, 2022. You're taking responsibility of anything uh, within the 200 feet of your property. For the, the, the 200 foot number is associated with uh, surveys for the uh, construction activities. But for the environmental purposes, what we're trying to do is understand what contamination is present on site and what happens to it once it is, has been released into the environment. And our understanding is that it's going to flow essentially downhill, either following the groundwater surface or following the, uh, the bedrock surface. Uh, we're, and we'll follow it to where it, where, where it, where it ends or uh, to the appropriate remediation levels that have been set by DOEE. Um, what is the land reemit? Re Re, oh Lord, the land re, re, re thank you, <laughs> group. 
DOEE looks at contaminated sites through a couple of different filters. For underground storage tanks, it, uh, they have an underground storage tank group that looks at releases and remediation. For other kinds of contaminants like chlorinated solvents, there is a second group that addresses remediations of those sites. And in the case of Northern Bus Garage, we actually have two different groups of DOEE looking at the environmental remediation of groundwater and soil. So the land reme remediation is looking at the chlorinated solvents and the UST branch is looking at the underground storage tanks. Thank you. So the group is based on, is the group I-D-O-E-E? -E, or yeah. this is a- it's a, uh, 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 it's a department within the Department of Environment, DOE. Department of Energy and Environment. And yes, and th these two groups, the underground storage tank group that works with petroleum and the land remediation group that works with chlorinated solvents, both of those groups are in the Department of Energy and Environment. And I'm sure the gentleman here has a card if you want to speak with, he's with DOE. So. From the, I'm from the underground storage tank branch. My name is Nazmul Haq. If you have any questions, you can contact me. And we have Apurva Patil from the chlorinated solvent land remediations group site. So we are representing DOE here, you know. Okay, um, one before I forget, um, Donzel had made a statement that this presentation will be online, I guess maybe a couple of days from now. Um, it's there now. Oh, it's there now. I, I wanted to make this recommendation to the, to the team that um, you all consider providing the presentation in advance because to ask this community to ask you questions on the fly, we're only seeing it for the first time. We limited to one hour to get five or six different presentations. And it's really unfair to us. I wouldn't mind having these quarterly meetings delayed at least a few days so that we can see the presentation perhaps even have the opportunity to send you questions in advance. Because other than that, I don't know how much good having a meeting every three months, dumping all this information on us. I don't know how many people in my neighborhood are knowledgeable about the environment, knowledgeable about construction, knowledgeable about zero emissions. It just gives us a little time to Right. You know, kind of catch up with stuff, you know, and, and be on the same page. Right. Um, Jim, you had mentioned Mr. Oka, Arkansas. And I think th that valid point re re deserves a response. So I know that it's put up at least 24 hours in advance. So oh, what it really okay. sounds like it, though, is one, how is the community made aware that the slide deck is available to them? Right. So that's what I'm saying. Okay. So I hear the question. So I wanted to make sure, you know, we can do a better job of saying, at the same way we send out a reminder of the meeting, we can also say, and the slide deck is available for review. Right, okay. that would help. Um, it was mentioned about Arkansas and Buchanan. I, I understand that anything that's underground is going to flow downhill. Mm -hmm. um, the community knows, and I think Wamadi is aware, that in addition to its underground tanks that were there in the past, the old Gulf Chevron gas station, which was at the corner of 14th and Buchanan, where the parking lot is um, for the Ethiopian church, and where the actual church is, was a Verizon, uh, well, it was the old C&P depot that had underground gas tanks. So there was a, a confluence of events that took place where one or all of those tanks leaked. So off-site at that 14th and, I'm not, not 14, at the Arkansas and Buchanan, um, has there been any testing 
off of you all's lot. lot. We have done some testing across Arkansas Avenue. I believe we've done one sa a sample across Buchanan, but they, they were they were specifically designed to be down gradient of our site, not down gradient of other sites. Yeah, but I mean, well, did you find anything? Uh, not across Arkansas Avenue, and I don't believe we had anything across Buchanan either. Because there, there was a slide up there where you particularly specifically pointed out Arkansas and Buchanan. Um, I mean, I'll go look at it and this I'll see. Uh, DOE would like to also. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. We have two cases associated with that property, okay? Both of them are closed. So if you are interested to have more data, we have soil, groundwater data along this uh, Ethiopian chart. You know, so we have two closed cases. So you can contact us. We can provide all the information that you need. But we do have enormous amount of data associated with that neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, my last question is, is this. Um, Jim, you did mention that there would probably be one small tank on the Buchanan side for the generator. Um, the location of Metro Transit Police Department at 14th and Buchanan, will they have any underground tanks for gas and how will their vehicles be serviced? Because my understanding is that's where NTPD is going to be moving. That's what we were told earlier. I, I can answer that, Jim. Thanks, Phil. Um, I, I so don't, I don't, what, okay, I didn't know. No, 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 so, no what, what, what we have at the uh, Northern Bus Garage is a small subdivision. So it's a small Metro PD outpost, if you will. It's not the main MPD station. It never was intended to be. Their vehicles, uh, from a standpoint of maintenance will be managed offsite. And I believe, and Amy may be able to answer this, some of those non-revenue vehicles on the roof are assigned to the, the MPD subdivision. I, I don't know if you can answer whether the goal is to also convert the majority of MPD police vehicles to uh, green energy as well. have an answer for that today. Yeah, it, but if they are still using gas, there is no, they will be fueling offsite, whether it's, yeah, I, yeah it, it, will, it will not, it will be at the local gas station or some other Wilmot property. Small. Yeah. Just want to make sure it's, yeah, it's, it's a substation. It's an outpost. Yeah. yeah. If there's an online question, then I'll make it up. We have uh, one question from Beatrix Field online and uh, it's, will the DOEE representatives information be shared uh, with those online? I'd, I'd, I'd invite the individuals to reach out to Dunzel and Dunzel can provide the contact information. Is that okay? Right, so we will provide the contact information for DOEE. Um, in fact, if I know my team, um, Emma, and they may be putting it in the chat right now, but if not, we will make sure that they have it. And of course, those who are in the room, we'll make sure you get it as well. Just to answer, I mean, one general information to all of you. Whenever we get any reports from any sites, not only for this one, any other sites we have in DC, we always have 30 to 60 days open period for the community members to make a comment, okay? So it's not only 24 hours or one day. So anytime, like for example, they submitted the report, comprehensive site assessment report, I uploaded that any community member give me your comments within 30 days. So 30 days is a long period of time. So we do provide plenty of times to listen to our citizens and to listen to their comments. So just to let you know. I'm just not knowing. No, this is like, I'm just no. just, yeah, I could not even know. So that's the DOEE. -E. No, 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 what I'm saying is this. We asked 
So this information, months ago, millions of and what we were told was we would, they would check with DOE to see if it was all right to release it. Now he comes in and says, we got 30 to 60 days to make a comment. This is, this is not the way to run a railroad. Yeah, but I think them being here is because of the request that they give you information. Yeah, but he's late. He's late. We asked meetings ago to have this information. And what we were told, you go back and listen to the recording, what we were told was that we'll check with DOE to see if it's okay for us to release the Right, so. One thing is that once we approve it and we approve it, they don't need a document can be shared with the public. Because I'm sorry, could you, you, the mic didn't, if you could repeat that. So once we get the document, we review the document, we give them comments, they change the document, sometimes it, this is necessary as per our requirements. Sometimes the document is changed several times and that process can take like few months. And once document gets final, we approve it and then only it is available for public for review. And if that time you feel anybody has questions, then they can ask the questions. Hold on one second. We can't have more than one person asking a question. So I guess I want to make sure I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you the microphone so you can ask directly. But what what I hear you saying is, and I want to make sure I'm clear, is that during the review period it is not shared. Once that is concluded, then the document is shared. But that period takes may take a very amount of time. Yes, because sometimes there are a lot of discussion points. Sometimes a lot of times we do not agree upon. Uh, with Bamata's recommendations or whatever, any responsible party's recommendations. So it takes time for us to review and approve the document for public right. sharing. Thank you. So, you want to ask a question? Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm going to say this in hopes that everyone understands what it is that I'm saying. At least two meetings ago, which would be at least six months, no, maybe nine months ago, because this is first, what is it, spring? Um, okay, the spring meeting. So we're talking about back in 22, maybe the spring meeting of 22, we were presented environmental information to the community. And the community asked to see the results of that information, the information that was being presented to us. And we were told then, and repeatedly when we asked for it, that, that in, they would check with DOEE to see if it was okay to release the information. So how do we comment on information 30 to 60 days that's almost a year old? So that's, that's the piece. I think that we, thank you for that. So the question is, because you're saying 30 day period, how, to, from is a DOE perspective, how are the, is the public made aware that they have the opportunity to make comment? Would that be like they contact and say, hey, I have questions about this um, site. What would they do in order to be made aware? Jim, sorry. Yes, I did, as you, you correctly indicated, I said that we would post it online once DOE had so I, I did say that. Uh, to my knowledge, the comprehensive site assessment, the first of the two documents has been posted online. That was my understanding. The second of the two documents, the supplemental site assessment. So we did the comprehensive site assessment. We realized based on conversations with DOEE that we had some holes that we needed to fill in. Uh, and that's when we did a second round of uh, sampling called the supplemental site assessment. That has not been posted yet. Uh, I did show you the results from that. That's the second data set shown this evening. That's not been posted yet. And again, it, it goes back to, I wanna make sure that DOE is, is on board with what we're saying here uh, before that goes up. Is that, does that clarify that for you? But the first one is posted now? To my knowledge, it is. Okay. So. Publish it, you know, to the website, you know. So like, SSA supplemental report, we haven't finished our review yet. Once we are done, 
then we give it to them. You can update, and community member has the opportunity to comment. Right. I thank you, Dr. Higgin. So, the, 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 the outstanding question is public notification. So I get the process, and I think everyone hears the process. What I'm also hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I know this gentleman here has a question, is how are you made aware when it's releasable? Is that accurate? No. Thank you. So, sir, I know you had a question. Okay, so you get the information, you review it. Are you approving it or you review it so it can be sent out to the public to comment on? Once we approve, only that. Once we approve, we made all the comments between Wamata or any responsible party. Once it is finalized, then we upload for general public to make comments and send it to us. If I can, because I want to walk through the process, because I'm a little slower than most. An issue comes up. DOE is made aware of it. Some level of inspection investigation happens. The project team provides a report to DOEE. You all review it, and then it becomes approved. What I think the question is, when in that process is the question or comment period. It's public, nothing, nothing is, you know, like within DOE's like, you know, small room, all underground storage tank is that we have, everything is public. So anytime if you have any questions, we have all the information in the website. You can reach it to us. And if we do not respond to your comments or concern, then you can go to the complaint chain. But we always respond to our citizens' questions. So what I hear you saying, I think, is, Dr. Hague, if you have an environmental question about the project, the place to go is to DOE. The general, general, general question box. Yeah, right. Yes. So yeah. regarding environment, right to the any, question box. In, regarding any environmental questions, there is a general question. I mean, box. You can reach through that. So and then they, the middle person, yeah, comes straight to you. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> you, okay. your folks need to have a meeting with the community because you're you're explaining this process now you approve of it then we have 30 days to say we don't like it so what is the process after that we're not going to go into that tonight thank you okay but you need to have a a a, uh, a meeting with the community and explain the process that you have approved of that we have uh, issues with. All right, so one of that shared information. So we have a question online. Yes, so uh, many residents in the area of the bus barn are added. Is it possible for them to be added to a uh, list, email list regarding any matter related to the bus barn? And then the second question is, will they be given sufficient notice of when environmental information is released in order to make comment? So the answer regarding email list communication is yes. I want to ask, for, since these questions are online, if uh, Nina or Emma can reach out to that person directly to capture that information, and we'll make sure they're added to the list. And the second question? The, the second question is, will sufficient notice be given for when the environmental information is released? Yes, yeah, right, we'll notify through that list when it goes online. Thank you. Mr. Bridgewater, Mr. Lupin, thank you. Any other comments, questions from the room? All right, with that. Uh, thank you. We are in a conversation, WMATA is in a conversation with representatives of DOEE, Dr. Hawk and Ms. Patel, uh, about the nature of the investigation, the extent of the investigation, so that we can ensure that we have the contamination appropriately characterized and that our remediation measures uh, are, are appropriate for what we're doing. We recognize we have a once in 100 year opportunity to get in and clean up in the remediation of the past uh, 100 years and, and we intend to exploit that to the best of our ability. 
what we're looking to do is ensure that the site is cleaned up in a manner that's protective of human health and the environment. Thank you, Jim. With that, I'll turn it over to Amy Rosrobian to talk about the electrification project update. Okay. Great, Excellent. thank you. One second while we advance the slide. Okay. So good evening, everyone. I'm Amy Mesrobian. I'm uh, the director of Zero Emission Vehicles for Metro. Um, excited to uh, be able to talk with you today. So Metro is moving forward on its zero emission bus transition and Northern is a key part of that process. So as we shared last time, Metro is committed to reopening Northern as a 100% zero emission bus facility. So that means that when the facility reopens, only zero emission battery electric buses will operate out of the facility. The project will include overhead pantograph charging in the garage to charge the buses. There will be no diesel buses um, when the facility reopens. Um, so we're really excited about this, um, this announcement and this step forward. We recognize the importance of this decision for the community. Um, and just, you know, thank you again to everyone for being advocates of clean um, zero emission buses in your community. Um, so the facility is being designed for up to 150 battery electric buses with a mix of standard length and articulated buses. Um, the reconstruction project increases the capacity for the larger articulated buses at Northern um, to provide more capacity for customers on Georgia Ave, 14th Street, and 16th Street. Um, so right now there's a mix of articulated and standard length buses on those corridors, and um, this new project allows most of those trips to be operated by articulated buses. Um, since Northern will be one of Metro's first facilities to fully support zero emission buses, this project is very important to Metro's overall uh, transition to zero emission buses um, and for the region as well. Um, so Metro is accelerating work to transition our entire bus fleet to zero emissions by 2042. Um, our recently released zero emission bus transition plan outlines a path for the full conversion of the bus fleet by 2042, which is three years ahead of the previous goal that we had shared. Um, and so reflecting this plan, um, about two weeks ago, Metro's board of directors um, adopted this accelerated goal for our full fleet conversion of nearly 1,600 buses um, across Metro. Um, so again, thank you to everyone who's advocated for zero emission buses. We're really excited um, that Northern is, is going to be one of our first um, all zero emission bus um, facilities and, and really leading um, this effort both for Metro and for the region. Um, so, so thank you and, and we're excited to be able to provide these um, local air quality benefits to the Northern community. All right, I think we have a hand raised in the chat. So we're gonna allow that person to come off mute and ask their question. I believe it was Aubrey. Hi, this is Audrey Wanda. Um, I had a question about the number of articulated buses. I'm not clear on that. I know there'll be 150 electric buses. How many of those are going to be articulated? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So, right, um, up to 150 electric buses um, at the facility. Um, I don't have the, the exact breakdown between standard and articulated at this point, um, but we are expecting to be able to increase the number of um, articulated buses on, uh, on some of the routes that will run out of Northern um, as a result of this new project. So. Will be 50 50, so it'll be 75 Arctics and 75 city buses, uh, which is a huge improvement. As Amy's noting, the old BICS was only 10% articulated, we'll be going to 50, so it will really increase the capacity service on your routes. Thank you. I have a question in the room. There's been, I mean, I've read a number of articles about the concern of electric buses being able to stay out on the street 
in the way that buses on 14th Street, 16th Street, and Georgia Avenue do today. So how are we going to actually accomplish this goal? There, there's, battery technology doesn't seem to be at the point where it can guarantee a bus can go out and be out on the street for 14 hours and you know, then get back and get recharged and ready to go again the next day. So, I'm, I mean, I, I think it's a great idea, but I want to know how realistic is it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so we are trying to move forward with our zero emission bus transition in a in a you know thoughtful and planned out way. Um, so, one thing that we've done um, and and that we'll do as part of this project is route modeling. So, um, the the kind of concept that you're mentioning is the range of vehicles and how battery electric vehicles, battery electric buses have shorter ranges um, than conventional vehicles. Um, and so one thing that we'll be looking at closely is um, we'll, we'll model um, the routes that we expect to deploy out of Northern um, with the, um, the kind of range limitations of battery electric buses to make sure that as we do our bus planning and our bus scheduling, um, this allows us to operate the buses in a way to complete all of the different routes or blocks um, that we serve on. So, so there is a very detailed um, planning process that goes into all of this to make sure that we are able to complete um, all the service that we need. So uh, the first question that we have is, uh, what is an articulated bus? Oh, <laughs> um, yes, thank you. So. Um, but basically, in our, our bus fleet, um, uh, many of our buses are kind of a standard length or a 40-foot bus, um, and articulated buses are a lot bigger than that. They're about 60 feet in length, and articulated sort of refers to the fact um, that, that the buses kind of pivot around a, a central point when they can turn um, because they're a lot longer. So that's, so the, that's the longer. Term growing up was accordion middle. That's what we <laughs> accordion middle. Right. Yeah. So, so the yes. Yeah, so the articulated buses are, are bigger buses with a capacity for a, a lot more um, a, a riders inside. Thank you. Another question online, and then Mr. Are they coming off mute? Hi. This is Audrey Wanzi again. Um, the, my issue with the articulated bus is that when they enter and exit. It, they do it sometimes extremely recklessly, and it's scary how fast that long double bus comes in and out of the garage. What safety measures are being put in place so that pedestrians and cars are safe walking and driving along 14th Street? So um. I guess there are a couple of questions. I don't know if that's an yeah. electric bus question. I think that's more of a design project question. Oh, uh, a driver question, right. <laughs> standpoint on the design side, all of the buses will be exiting through a signalized intersection that will be completely upgraded to the latest DDO sta DDOT standards with the pedestrian lights, the audible signals for uh, the vision impaired, Etc. So it'll be a fully modernized intersection to exit safely and interact with those uh, pedestrian, bicycle, and other vehicle movements. Um, I would have to defer to others in Walmart about the on-street operation uh, in the future. Relative to the vehicles entering, all of our vehicles will return to the garage off of Buchanan Street um, uh, through that driveway and. Uh, the interior geometry has a uh, design speed limit of five miles an hour, so they are coming across that sidewalk slowly because they have to make some uh, relatively tight turns inside the building as they enter. Thank you. We have a question in the room. I don't have the numbers in front of me here, but I do have them back at my office. The Northern is scheduled to reopen in 2027. If, if I recall, I can't remember the numbers right now, but the procurement schedule for purchasing electric buses, you're not going to have 150 of them by 2027. 
Um, so, so we have options that could allow us to purchase uh, that number of buses by 2027. Um, so. I, you know, one of the other things that we have to plan really carefully is trying to align our bus deliveries with when the facilities um, will be open. You know, we want to make sure that um, when, when we take delivery of the buses, we have a place. To, exactly, exactly. We have somewhere to put them. Um, but also, you know, the, the facilities need buses for the commissioning process as well. So we'll need some buses before the facilities open. Um, to do some of that commissioning of all of the charging equipment as well. So, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to line up those two things um, to make sure that, um, you know, we have the facilities ready before we take delivery of the buses in large number, but, we, you know, we also don't want the facilities sitting around without buses. So, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure those things are, are really closely coordinated. And, and I think this also speaks to just the uh, beyond the project, Funding priorities have changed, funding availability federally have changed. And I guess that's what kind of, you know, came to the announcement of the new accelerated schedule. Yeah, I, I mean, one, one thing, um, I, I think as an organization, Metro is really committed to the zero emission bus transition. Um, and so we do have plans in our capital budget um, allocating uh, or, or kind of identifying the need for funding for um, both the bus purchases and for facility conversions for Northern and for some of our other facilities that will need to be converted as well. So I, I, I know it's warm. If anyone needs a water in the room, there's water in the back. Just want to make sure. I think we have another question in the room. Just a quick question off the top of my head. Um, the buses will be primarily recharged inside the garage, right? But is there any thought to give into um, on street um, charging, like at Fortington, Colorado, or um, elsewhere, where the bus could get a hot shot to give it a um, an extended street life? Sure, yeah, so so um, on route charging is something that we are thinking through right now. Um, it's it's an option like you're saying, you know, it, it can help extend the range of buses or it can kind of provide some operational flexibility or just, you know, kind of um, other, uh, you know, charging locations. Um, we've started to think through with some other uh, regional transit operators as well, um, if we can identify locations that might be good for shared um, charging with other with other bus operators in the region. So it, it's definitely something um, that we're thinking through um, how it how it can help us um, operationally. That in California, um, Foothill Transit mm -hmm. um, had a problem when they started to mass introduce uh, electrics. They had a problem with the buses dealing with the hills, right. and the buses didn't perform very. And, and technology has changed. Mm -hmm. I, I'll get it. Mm -hmm. But I, in my in my head, I'm still thinking about even when they leave the garage, they're going up that hill, right? And then they, like a rocket, they're going to try to shoot out in a signalized uh, thing. But that's still a huge drain on the bus, right? Right from right from the get go. So yeah, exactly. I apologize. I'm going to hold that, and then we're going to. I'm gonna, I just need you to come back around to it. I'm gonna let you because just because of the time, okay. but because I know there are a lot of answers, but I want to give just a quick in the next Q and A. I'm gonna let you respond to that, but I want to make sure we get keep the moving to the next, and then I'll make sure you have an opportunity to speak to that. Okay. Thank you so much. So next line, and over to Maya for next steps. And just a reminder where we have what to expect 2023, and then we have art and transit. So what to expect for 2023 and, and uh, forward, um, we started the mass demolition in January 25th, uh, 2023. Um, we'll be ready to start the structural seal assembly next year, the second quarter, 2024. Uh, in 2025, the second quarter, we'll start the finishes. And in 2026, the third quarter, we'll start the acceptance uh, testing. And finally, we'll achieve um, expected project completion by the second quarter of 2027. So how to follow up uh, on the project? Uh, there is a form that you can uh, sign up online for uh, project updates. Our website is wamata.com backslash northern bus garage. 
Um, we also have an email address dedicated to the project, MCAP underscore Northern Bus Garage underscore reconstruction underscore project at WMATA.com. Um, we'll be announcing the next uh, community meeting uh, for the summer 2023. Um, you can also follow us on the various media sites for additional information on the project. Thank you. Amy, and then any additional questions? So Amy, do you want to respond to the- Oh, sure. Um, uh, yes, so uh, the question was sort of about, uh, I think, topography. And so one of the things that we consider in our route modeling is the topography of all of the routes. So that's one of the factors that goes into our route modeling. And so routes that are hillier will use more energy. And so that's one of the things that we factor in um, when we do the analysis and before we would deploy um, any of the buses. Um, but yeah, I mean, to your point about um, other transit agencies, um, we're definitely, you know, taking lessons learned from other transit agencies and how they've um, adopted a lot of this technology. I think with en route charging, um, we, we've kind of gotten mixed feedback from folks. Sometimes it's um, they found it too expensive, or it actually introduces additional um, operational or logistical complexities. So. Um, so, you know, we know some transit agencies have deployed on route charging and then backed away from it. So it, it's something that, you know, we're, we're definitely analyzing um, and we'll figure out how uh, it best works for Metro and how, how, you know, we can incorporate it for us and for the region going forward. Thank you. Questions? We missed one item on, I know it's, we're pressed for time. We didn't talk about AIT. Our transit? That's what I just said. It's right after Oh, okay. Section. Okay. Just to uh, answer your question, uh, the turnaround is 14th in Colorado. It has been roughed in for electric. All they're waiting for is the Pepco to bring the lines in. So it's been done. Thank you. All right. So we have Amy. And I'm sorry. I said Amy. And Delaney joining us online. Um, to present art and transit. Regrettably, uh, Laurent had a scheduling conflict, so he was unable to join us today. Anne? Yes, good evening. My name is Anne Delaney. I'm the pro project coordinator for the art in transit program. Next slide, please. So, um, over 100 temporary uh, banners uh, with graphics were installed along the periphery of the construction site in March 2023. The Art in Transit team, along with the project team, will monitor the banners to ensure they are maintained in good condition. Next slide, please. A total of 20 different graphics were developed in partnership with the community to capture key dates and information about the garage's 100 plus years of history. The 25 graphics are repeated along the periphery of the site and they include 17 whimsical representations of the neighborhood local landmarks and public transportation over the years. And nine of those panels include historical facts and information. And we have displayed here the 25 panels that are repeated over uh, you know, the fence that surrounds the, uh, the construction site. Next, next slide, please. And this slide shows more specifically the nine banners uh, that depict historical themes, such as uh, and, and that focus, you know, around the uh, northern bus garage and the neighborhood, and it includes, you know, before the car, car barn, before streetcars, garage building design, creation of the Capital Transit Company, which is CTC, CTC ticket design, and up, you know all the way down to women operator, operators and drivers, as well as fair employment practices. So these also are uh, displayed, you know, throughout uh, the, uh, uh, with the other 17 banners along the 
the construction site. And that, that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Ron is here, so one of the things, just put it out there before it's added. One of the slides, the panels was omitted. It will be re-added, and that was, um, it was added today uh, to the to the panels. So, questions That's regarding good. art and transit. Comments? comments? Well, let me get my water for the comment. I want to see if there are any questions first. Question online. Hi, I. This is Audrey Wanze again. Um, I just wanted to find out if WMATA has any plans to put a museum. It's been mentioned that this project is a once in a 100 year project. It would be nice to see some type of, of museum um, in the city uh, regarding the history of, of, WMA, of buses, all the transit, bikes included. Um, is there any thought given to a museum being on site? Jim. Uh, thank you. Not so much for a museum, but there will be some interpretive exhibits as part of the project approval process. WMATA engaged in what's called a Section 106 consultation project with uh, the Office of Historic Preservation of the District of Columbia. Uh, the outcome of that was a memorandum of agreement that uh, specified a number of things. Among those are interpretive signs that explain the history of the uh, car barn facility. Uh, we uh, prepared some reports documenting the historic nature of the facility, technical reports. We also will in place, uh, place some streetcar rails that will extend from the facade of the car barn down to the curb of 14th Street that would, will show where streetcars left the 14th Street right of way and entered into the car barn facility. So there will be some historic uh, interpretive exhibits uh, that uh, I think are responsive to your question. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So I know Mr. we had a small group, you articulated disappointment, we saw the emails. And I know you wanna be able to make your statement here, so. I'm really um, insulted by this art and transit piece because it doesn't reflect this community, the 16th Street Heights community. Um, there is plenty, plenty of historical information that is available about WMATA and it's discriminatory practices over the over decades, their refusal to either train or hire black people, to put A. Philip Randolph on there, that's an insult. He had nothing to do with a bus garage. But you're gonna stick something up there about employment practices, which he did have something to do with, but nothing having to do with Northern. His claim to fame is railroads. How did he get up there? I mean, who, who's in charge of this project? Because it can't be any black people that's working in art and transit. Can't be. And if, it, if it is, it's only one. And that person is not in a decision-making process. You honoring women up there, but it's only white women. You don't honor the black women the one who was hired in 1944 and then fired in 1945 when they found out she was black. And where's Richard Pettigrew? He was the first, first operator that you all hired, 1955. And then my friend, or at least my father's friend, or the friend my friend of his father, Pop Saunders, he was the first opera, black operator for the subways. He's not up there. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. For me, it is embarrassing. And if you want to honor somebody for Northern, I sent you a list of at least six drivers that I know that worked out of Northern. 
lived in 16th Street Heights, including me. I'm not up on there. I got history. So you can't have, you can't come into our neighborhood and disrespect it this way. Because you wouldn't allow me to come in your neighborhood and raise hell in your neighborhood. But you're going to come in mine and going to insult us like this. I really don't appreciate it. And this is not the first time that I've raised this as an issue. It's really not. And, and, and it's, it's, it is embarrassing. It is embarrassing for you all, and it's embarrassing for me that I've got to sit up here in front of some adults. There are only adults in this room and raise issues that you all are not even aware of. That's the history. And it's disrespectful for no one to even recognize that history. Am I looking for WMATA to give me reparations? Yes. That's the least you could do. That's the very least you could do. And it's not lost on me that the only panel that was missing is the one with the black man on it. How did that happen? I'm just, I think these are questions people want to know. I want to know the answers to them. Because somebody has to be held accountable. You cannot come into someone else's neighborhood and treat them this way. And the thing that, that's really bothering me is I don't understand how this neighborhood even tolerates this nonsense. Because other neighborhoods I've been in, you all respect those neighborhoods. I went to the Ward 3 meeting. And I'm going to the next one and the next one and the next one. Because I'm going to see for myself how you all treat white people in Ward 3 and how you treat us over here. I've seen it for myself. They had a presentation over there. I got one, two, three, five people in front of me and one on the phone. I go to Ward 3, they got two. Two. Bus operation and commercial. I come over here, I got to deal with six people. And the only reason Weston's in a position that they're in now is because of us. Because when they get up to Ward 3 at Weston, they ain't going to have to fight for no electric buses. Because we fought for them and got them. That's the difference. And I want to know when we're going to get, what are we going to get in this neighborhood for a half billion dollar project do you know it takes you 72 years to count just a million dollars they're talking about a 500 million dollars and we get what what's the community get? I, I, I can't I, I don't have the answer but I know we need to get something we need to get a memorandum of understanding respiratory diseases we, we, need, we, we need for WMATA to start respecting this community. What does that respect look like, Mr. Duke? Well, I can tell you one thing. It doesn't, it doesn't allow for the Metro, Metropolitan Transit Police Department to be in the neighborhood. When I look at Decatur Street, and I've raised this, when I look at Decatur Street, Decatur Street was closed. That east-west traffic was closed somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s. And it was closed because of an environmental assessment that WMATA did in 1985, where they showed that as one of the solutions to the assessment was to cover Decatur Street to keep the fumes and the particulate matter from escaping into the community. So I want to want to make sure. So I know that. So I know that there are certain parts that we. So if you if you if you would like to answer questions, sir, I, I will give you the mic. But I want to make sure everyone has the opportunity here. So if you want, I'm more than happy to give you opportunity to answer questions. But I wanted. So I think certain parts can't give a reasonable answer. So I'm not going to try to give an answer that it can. But I did hear a couple of things that, you know, deserve an answer around the planning of the police station, Metropolitan Police Station, and more information around, you know, 
the community aspect of this pro community benefit aspect of this project. And I know you know it's like, why can't we have more frequent meetings? Right, which is, and that's the other, how communication happens. Right, I mean, oh, 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 why can't I have a number to call somebody? Like, I, I, I raised the field today about people parking on 14th Street that work at the facility. Why can't I have a number where I can call or an email that I can send and say, look, this truck is parked here. They're working in the thing. I got three of them. Yeah, I'm backing up because <laughs> it's like we both right on you, and I, I don't want to do that. So, so I know, but I thank you for that, Mr. Okay. It's the phone number is on the website. It's monitored by the JSA team. They send emails as soon as they get an email or a phone call to the project team to respond to. And I do everything possible with my team to make sure that we have an answer back within hours, at worst case the next day, depending on when we receive the notice that is, is feedback from the community. So those tools are out there and, you know, certainly. There's only one point of clarification. It is actually monitored by the Metro team. It's Metro, I call it, it's, it's monitored by the communications team that provides yep. contact to us if there's a notice. So is, 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 is this the same phone number and email that people can complain and nobody responds to? So I've been trying to track down what number that is because I've tested this one. But if it is, then we'll find out. I know we have one question online and then we'll, we'll come back. Online from Commissioner Carla Ferris. Is there any update on the removal dates for the generators on Arkansas Avenue and, Avenue and 14th Street? I'm particularly interested in any updates regarding the generator on Arkansas Avenue, which has been problematic for residents. Thank you. Presentation. Uh, all of the infrastructure on our side is in inspected. The meters are set. What PEPCO has told us, they've promised a date in March. They promised a date in April. They promised a date today, May 9th. And last Thursday, they reached out and said, we still don't have the transformers that they need to set on the pole to provide us our power. So we are, they only allow equipment that's certified by them and they have a backlog order of transformers and we do not have a date certain, unfortunately, but we're beholden to PEPCO. All right, any additional questions in the room? So did you have a question? I mean, I think the situation with Decatur Street, from my recollection, in the late 70s, it was like a thoroughfare. There were buses that ran from Carter Barron over Decatur Street, made a right turn on 13th Street, and headed downtown. And people complained about there being so much bus traffic on Decatur Street. So people were happy that I remember when they closed Decatur Street, they eliminated those buses, and uh, everybody was pretty happy for a long time. But I do think, I, I certainly think that the history of black employment at Metro, you know, which really actually predates Metro. It was Capital Transit and DC Transit that had the more discriminatory policies. By the time Metro took over in 1973, the workforce was already 60 or 70 percent African American, and among the drivers it's close to 90 percent African American. So there was a fairly dramatic change. And the problem now is that the neighborhood has become so affluent in gentrification that Almost no one who's going to be able to work for Metro can live in the neighborhood anymore. Uh, so that's an issue that really should be dealt with. I mean, there's people that there's about five or six people that were worked for Metro that spent 30 or 35 years there that are live in the neighborhood any longer. Almost everyone else who have worked at one time or another for Metro has been forced either not able to move into the neighborhood or been forced to move out because of skyrocketing real estate prices in the community. Thank you. There you go. I'm still there too, but there's only five of us left. So thank you all. That concludes this evening's report. We are, again, there are members of DOEE here. If you would like to be put on the mailing list or not,